For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2005 Midwinter Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Monday afternoon, December the 26th, 2005. The speaker of the afternoon is Dr. William Knoll, speaking on the spirit of bondage. Lord, we come before you now, Lord God, to open your word, Lord, to set the captives free, Lord. For you came to set the captives free, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Lord, we come before you now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to open your word. Lord, we ask that you release the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, that our understanding will be enlightened, Lord, and we'll behold you in your glory and what is the hope of our calling and the power that you've been to us with. We come before you now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We just ask you to open it, Lord. I bind all I hold the enemy now, all the deceiving spirits. I bind the spirit of stupor. I bind the death and dumb demons and all the spirit of stupor that will try to settle on the people. I bind up the spirit of inattentiveness in the name of Jesus. As you, you said the angel Lord would encompass around those who fear the Lord and that you would encompass us with songs of deliverance. So Lord, let you... Angels, come forth now and encompass around this place, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Gather up all those loose demons and carry them off, Lord. Get them off the property. We just ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The, uh, I, uh, for the last, I've had a project for the last four years to write a book on rejection, its fruits, its roots, and its fruits. And I sent it to the publisher. And in the process, I have an ongoing revelation of the spirit of bondage. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I've talked about it before. And I want to show you a little bit about... Now, you notice here that uh, bondage has a number of sources and manifestations. Now, there is rejection in it. You can either... If you if you get offended and get rejected, you can either react with fear or with pride. And out of fear flows inferiority or insecurity, which will lead you to bondage. And out of fear can fear is a uh, denial of love. Rejection is a denial of love. Fear is being afraid that you're not loved, that you're not wanted. And so you turn to the world for love and fantasy. And you create your own world in which you're loved. And this is really a type of idolatry because in your fantasies you become God. You decide the circumstances. You decide who's going to be rewarded and who's going to be punished. And you control everything. And you become God. And that's a type of idolatry and that will lead you into bondage. Well, what is bondage? If you look up bondage in Webster's New International Dictionary, the third edition, on a bridge, it says bondage is a tenure or service of a villain, V-I-L-L-E-I-N, a serf or slave. What V-I-L-L-E-I-N is a uh, word most people have never heard. And so I looked it up to see what it meant. And it's an unfree peasant that is a slave as regards to his feudal lord but free in his legal relation with respect to all others. He has no rights against the Lord except that of protection from being maimed or killed and is subject to be sold by the Lord or removed from his lands at will. And so you can either be a slave by choice and live in your master's domain and be under his protection and his provision. And it's a choice that you make. Or you can be a slave, which means that you are totally owned by someone else. And the definition of that, a slave was a living tool. 
Aristotle said that a slave, the only difference between a slave and a shovel was that the slave was alive. The shovel was not. Both of them belonged to the master, and he could do whatever he wanted to with them. And if you are the devil's slave, you're a living tool. He can do what he wants to with you. And if he holds you in bondage, you become his slave. And if he holds you long enough, you can't get out. Okay. Now, the Greek scriptures from which there are four words translated bondage, all of them are derived from the word dolus, D-O-U-L-A-S. And the Strong's number is 1210. And it means a slave, literally or figuratively, voluntarily or involuntary, frequently as a qualified sense is subject to slavery, bondsman or servant. And so you see it comprises both the slave that's held in bondage against his will and the villain that is makes a choice. Paul said he was a slave of Jesus Christ. A servant. That word he uses there is bond, bondsman. He made that by choice. Now, if you're in idolatry, you'll be led into bondage. Look at Ezekiel 8.8. 8. No, so I'm sorry, 6. 9 to 10. And here the Lord is talking. He said, When those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where you are carried captive, because I was crushed by your idolatrous heart, which has departed from me with their eyes who play hall at their idols, they will loathe themselves for their evils which they committed in all their abominations. And they shall know that I am the Lord, for I have not said in vain I would bring this calamity upon them. And I'm going to tell you, if you are in bondage because of idolatry that the Lord has brought upon you, don't ask Brother Glenn, don't ask Brother Noel, don't ask Brother Simpson, don't ask Brother Lowry, Sister Gail, Brother Wade, to pray it off of you. Not until you repent, break the curse, and come out of that idolatry. Preachers, now, no preacher is going to be able to pray that thing off of you. Now, you can sit and you can justify that all you want to with situational ethics, with Greek philosophy, saying, oh, God, you understand. You understand, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm just a man. And, well, you understand, Lord, that I need that ice cream. You know, I need a little comfort, and that ice cream comforts me. You understand, Lord, that's just art. Look how beautifully that's portrayed. You understand, Lord, I'm just looking at the art. Besides, I'm not hurting anybody but myself. God, that doesn't cut any ice with God. God says, repent of your idolatry. Repent of your sin. And that means to confess it as wrong, be ashamed and humiliated by it, slap your thigh and say, oh, God, turn me. Help me turn from that and walk and not do it anymore. That's repentance. Until you've done that, no preacher can be able to pray it off for you. Now, let's look at this. Or you can have insecurity, inferiority will lead you into bondage. And that was, uh, well, there are other scriptures here. Isaiah eight nineteen to 12, y'all can read that one. Or Ezekiel twelve one to 3. Those are all scriptures where idolatry has led you into bondage. And y'all can read those at your leisure. Isaiah 8, 19 to 22. Now, in Numbers chapter 14, you'll find a scripture. And here the spies have come back from the promised land. And two of them have said, it's a wonderful, beautiful land and we'd be well able and let's go take that land. For our God is with us. But the other ten gave a bad report. and said, man, they got tall, fortified cities. We saw descendants of the giants. They're big people. And we were grasshoppers in our own sights. And so we were in theirs. And I call it the grasshopper spirit. It's from fear. And so, in verse 14, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept all night. And the people complained against the people of the children of Israel, complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, if we'd only died in the land of Egypt, if we'd only died in this wilderness, why has God brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And so they said to one another, 
Let us elect a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of Israel. And they laid there for forty days and forty nights, according to Deuteronomy. But here the grasshopper spirit of inferiority that fear will bring into you that you're just a grasshopper will cause you to go back into bondage. Go back into that thing that has held you in bondage. Go back to slave. Pressure fear. It says they have fear, terror, depression. Proverbs will tell you that anxiety in the heart brings heaviness. Proverbs 24, I think. You can look it up, though. It says heaviness. It says anxiety in the heart brings heaviness. The spirit of heaviness. Isaiah 64 speaks of the spirit of heaviness. Look at Isaiah 61, I'm sorry. And this is a great promise of God. Isaiah 61, verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy of mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And so depression and heaviness is a spirit. It is a spirit that comes on you and causes problems. So that you don't think well, your vision is cloudy, you can't think, your mind doesn't feel right, you get weariness, down, grief stricken, think nothing's going right, just be better if you just died. And so you get suicide and death from the spirit of heaviness. And so when someone comes into the doctor with that, what do they do? You need some Pozac or some Zoloft or a whole host of other drugs, all of which have side effects. And you get side effects. Oh, and so you get another drug for the side effect, which causes more side effects. And it's not uncommon to see somebody with a whole handful of pills. Because they've got anxiety of fear in their heart. Do you know what drives out fear? First John says, the love of God says fear drives out fear, for fear has torment. So, you've got a tormenting spirit that the love of God will drive out. These things will just cover it up. Because when you quit taking them, they come to, symptoms come back. I've known people who've been on Pozac for 15 years. And you're in bondage. Drugs will lead you to bondage. But now if you sort of happen with rejection, and you react with pride, now you can go into stubbornness, which is a type of idolatry and bondage. Or you can go into rebellion and witchcraft, rebellion and bitterness, which are the same word, And rebellion is a type of witchcraft, and witchcraft is a type of the occult, which will lead you into bondage. Let's look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. And here we will find Nehemiah praying. Nehemiah is after Chronicles, after Ezra. Chronicles, Ezra. And here Nehemiah is praying for the children of Israel. And you find that this is a sin that has come down through the family line. And what does he say? Starting with Nehemiah 9, 16. Has everybody got there? Anybody, has everybody found that? Hold up your hands if you found it. But they and our fathers acted proudly. They hardened their neck. That term hardened their neck means stiff neck became stubborn. It's an agricultural term. And refers to an oxen that doesn't want to bear the load, doesn't want to be yoked to work, wants to do his own thing. And so he stiffens his neck and holds his head up, and they can't get the yoke on him. It's stubborn. The, uh, I tell the story in, my, in the text about John and Jack. They were two mules that we had. They were large mules. Their mother had been a perching mare, and she stood about six feet. And these were huge animals. And John, he had another name, but it's not 
but uh, he had real dark hair, and he had another name, but it was uh, that's not uh, politically correct to use that word, so we'll call him John. Oh, John, he just, you could just, man, he, he'd take the bridle and get in the traces without that in trouble. But Jack, he didn't want to work. And he, when he didn't want to work, he'd hold up his head like this, and he'd back away. And Fleming, the overseer, was over was six and a half feet. And Fleming, could he would back him into the corner, and he could finally get the bridle on him. And then he could pull him over and finally get him into the traces, into the, and hook him up to the wagon. And then when you loaded the wagon with a load of hay, old Jack would just tighten up the trace chains just tight enough to look like he's working, you know. And he'd just be moving slow. And poor old John over there, he's struggling, man. He's just pulling up 90% of the load. He's just working in jail. And when Charlie, the driver, saw that Jack wasn't working, he encouraged him with the buggy whip. And he jumped forward and he would work until he thought Charlie wasn't looking and then he would slow down. And then Charlie would have to encourage him again. And, you know, well, after all, you know, uh, old Jack had much rather be in his stall eating oats or drinking water or rolling in the dust or whatever else mules do to satisfy their soulish desires, you know. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians that way. They're stubborn. They don't want to work. They want to do what they want to do, not what God wants them to do. They're stubborn. They don't hear God's Word. If they hear it, they back away from it and reason and logically or try to pass the word, pass that burden on to somebody else because they want to do what they want to do. You know, God has got to... He can encourage you. And so that's that's what it means. They were stiff-necked, okay? And did not heed your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their neck. And in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to bondage. And so not only were these people fearful, he says, they are proud. And pride brings stubbornness and rebellion, both of which lead to bondage. Now, stubbornness is a type of idolatry, and rebellion is a type of witchcraft. Now, let's look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. So we go back to the front of the book here. 1 Samuel 15. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, if you have a standard King James, the marginal reading is divination. And I really think divination is probably a better translation. And the the later translations use the word divination rather than witchcraft. It means the diviner and his feet, which is a type of idolatry of worshiping demons. Bitterness and rebellion and stubbornness. Bitterness and rebellion come from the same word, Mara. You remember in Exodus they came to the springs of Mara and they could not drink the water because the water was bitter. And if you look up this word rebellion, it can be translated rebellion or bitterness. You look up the words that are translated bitter, they can be translated bitter or rebellion. You look up the word stubborn, it can be pronounced, can be translated stubborn, or it can be translated rebellious. And so you see, bitterness, rebellion, and stubbornness are all interrelated. But they all lead to bondage, to slavery. And so you see the circular pattern. It goes around and around and around. And that is the nature of bondage. It is a circular thing. That this spirit will draw power from this spirit, and draw power from this spirit, and they'll draw power from these spirits. And these spirits will draw power back and forth. And so you're moving against a team, carefully organized, carefully crafted team to stand against you, to hold you in the bondage. I said, Lord, and I began to study this, and God gave me a vision of this thing, and that's what I saw. And I described it to Laura, and Laura 
drew for me what I saw. Only the one I saw had a lot more holes and a lot more. And uh, right in here there should be greed. But you see that thing? That's an octopus. And he has tentacles that go all over the body. Because the soul controls the body. And the soul controls the brain. And the body won't move unless the soul says move. You notice here, we got the TV and baseball and football and soccer, games. Over here, we got the sexual sin, we got the Playboy Club, and we got pornography, and we got a motel with hourly rates. And we got an octopus in there. And over here we got the money, the love of money. And over here we've got different types of drugs. And over here we got food. In your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 21. Deuteronomy 21:18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastised him, will not heed them. Then the father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And you have to realize that uh, the only drugs... Mind-bending drugs spoken of in the Testament, in the Bible, is alcohol. Either strong drink or wine. Or new wine. New wine was new grape juice which could or could not be fermented. The word where you see wine mostly means drunkenness. Now, if you have Dr. Prince, Derek Prince uses the example of two ladies who are being rejected, mistreated, by their husband. He says the Episcopalian lady will turn to the martini and she becomes an alcoholic. The Assembly of God lady to whom alcohol is denied will turn to the cookie jar and the pastry and she becomes a glutton, grossly overweight. Both of them are in bondage because of rejection, because of stubbornness, because of rebellion. Because the Word of God says you're not supposed to overeat. Now, where does it say you're not supposed to drink wine? Does not Proverbs, does not Psalms 104 say that uh, that He gives us oil to make our face shine and wine to gladden the heart? It does say that. It does indeed. It says in First Timothy, take a little wine for your stomach. Little, spoken of as a food. Let's. Uh, Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Now, all of you recognize that you are a priest, that you are a kingdom of priests, it says. In Revelation, that you are a kingdom of priests before God. And First Peter said he has made you priests before God. Do you all know that? Do you recognize that? Or do we have to read those scriptures? Let's see what Proverbs 31 it is not for kings, O Limel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice for all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to those who are bitter of heart. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery. That's what you're supposed to do with wine. You give it to somebody who's angry and bitter and rebellious and doesn't want to change, refuses to accept the love of God, wants things their way, they're bitter, they're rebellious and angry. Those are the people that you give wine to so they can forget their misery. And the streets have numerous alcoholics and they go, they're called winos. But it's not because you are a king and a priest before God. And if a priest went into the tabernacle with any alcohol or wine, it was punishable by 
death. And since you are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost, and constantly before God, it is not for you. That's what Scripture, that's a plain reading of Scripture, and you can, you can apply your situational ethics to that and try to make it right. But you will not change the plain reading of Scripture. We have far more food addicts than we do alcoholics, drug addicts. I interpret the word wine, it means actually means intoxication, to interpret all drugs that we have now. All the drugs, all the mind-bending drugs that you can get addicted to. They're having a real problem right now with kids in high school with uh, painkillers. Used to be Percodan, and I don't think they use that more. What's that new one they use, Dan? Oxytoxin. Oxytoxin. That's right. Oxytoxin. That's a new one on me. I never prescribe too much pain medication. I work with pediatrics, and children don't. They take take a little time off. That's about all I ever use for pain in children. Children have a high pain threshold. Now, sometimes if you had a broken arm or something, then the orthopedist would give them this. You had a broken bone. But most kids don't require a lot of pain medication. Uh, praise you, Lord Jesus. And so we've got this thing in here. We have some interesting things. It says, I think, I wish, I should, I should not. This one here says, just one more won't hurt. Just one more time. Just one drink. Mother says, I've earned this. I've earned this ice cream. I've stayed on my diet. I've earned this candy boy. I've been a good boy. That doesn't relate to any of y'all. To us, to me. And down here is a scripture that says, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves, let's look at it. It's Romans chapter 6. I can't read it there. Six sixteen. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? Where does it say that bondage is a spirit? Are we in Romans? Let's look at Romans 8. Romans 8.15 For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so bondage is a spirit. There's a spirit named bondage. Now let's look over at Hebrews. Chapter 1. I'm sorry, it's chapter 2. Verse 15. Starting with verse 14 to get the context. Hebrews 2.14. And so much then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Jesus didn't come to save the angels. All the people who will tell you that there's going to be a time of ultimate reconciliation in the eons where everything is brought together and God forgives everything and and Jesus and the devil are going to walk hand in hand down the streets of gold. That is a heresy of unbelievable proportion. It says, Jesus did not die for the angels. The angels that rebelled have been judged. And there is a fire prepared for them that Jesus spoke of in Matthew. And He said, they are prepared. And He says that those who side with the devil will go into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. If you stick with the devil and his rebellion, you will go with him. 
That is the ultimate fate of all who, re- who go with the devil in his rebellion. Now let's look at some of the common types of bondage. And this list is by no means complete. You got drugs, there's alcohol, beer, dip snuff, and you got alcohol, tranquilizer, street drugs, nicotine, you dip snuff, smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, you got caffeine, you got pop, coffee, chocolate, no dose, you got food, there's sweets. You know, I went to a, uh, a teaching on God's, on God's diet at the Baptist church, and they had a, uh, Dr. Russell from Fort Smith, who's a practicing radiologist there, and he gave an excellent talk. And he said the worst food that you could eat was a donut, because it's all sugar. And the second one was pop, either sugared pop or unsugared pop. You know, they did a study on comparing coffee and pop and water with people who had high blood pressure. And see if there's any relationship between the amount of coffee they drank, the caffeine. You see, coffee has a lot more caffeine than pop, about four times as much. And to see if they had any relationship between the caffeine and the blood pressure. And they came out with an interesting, very interesting results. They found that those people who drank coffee and those people who drank water, incidence of high blood pressure was the same. But those who drank pop had an increased instance of high blood pressure, whether it was sugared pop or unsugared pop. And then another study showed that if you drank one can of pop a day over your lifetime, that you were three or four times more likely to have type 2 diabetes as an adult. Doesn't that make you feel? Now, if you only drink one can a week, you only got a 20% chance in the population at large. So pop is not something good for you. And you go down to the grocery store, down to Kroger's or Walmart's, and they got a whole rows of sugar water. The only sugar spoken of in the Bible is honey. And if you eat too much of that, it'll make you vomit. And the Bible says so. I used to be a beekeeper, and I can tell you that's true. I didn't chew the, I only chewed the cone twice. When I was extracting honey, the first time I got sick and I didn't know what it was. The second time I got sick again, I'd ask him, no more honey. Then my father told me, you shouldn't be chewing that. And there's lots of things here that you can reward yourself with a big feast. Empty the refrigerator. Peanut butter and jelly and crackers. Sweets, candy, donuts, sweet rolls. All those things. We're going to talk about how it works in a minute. Sexual activity. All kind of all kind of bad things there. Pornography on the cable, uh, cable TV, uh, video stores, internet, uh, various types of sex publications, uh, and self gratification. Uh, if you get rejected, you know, you just go out and try to find somebody to love you. No smile. That can be a real problem for some people who have been rejected and hurt, and that bondage spirit grabs them. Sexual overindulgence with a marital partner. Withdrawal. You can withdraw into your work, become a perfectionistic or an alcoholic, I mean workaholic. You can have all kind of hobbies. You can go on trips. You can do the bookworm, sex, I mean uh, sports activities. Hunting and fishing and television watching, you can just withdraw all kind of ways. Being bondage to anger. You don't have to beat your spouse. You don't have to yell at your spouse. You can kick the dog, slam the door, and hit the wall, get in the car and grind off a pound of rubber down the road. All those are types of bondage to anger and frustration and immaturity, rebellion. Road rage is a real problem today. You can change your appearance. You know, if I just get some highlights in my hair, maybe people will love me. If I just change the color of my hair, you know, if I was just a blonde. You know, blondes have more fun. Oh, gosh, you know, I got this stomach here. I'm going to go in and get one of the tummy tuck, you know. I once went to a uh, continuing education course when Rogan first came out. 
It was a hair restorer for men in 1983. And this dermatologist who was giving the talk, and she talked about the laboratory tests that you had to do to make sure this wasn't having bad toxic side effects and so forth. And when they got through, she said it cost $300 a month. Now, in 1983, $300 was a lot of money. A lot more than it is today. Probably seven, eight hundred dollars now. A month. Forever. I mean, forever. You don't ever get through pain. You minute you stop taking it, your hair all falls out. It don't start gradually. It, it, it just drops out and then you're where you've been if you've never taken it. So once you start it, you can't stop. And I said, Doctor, surely we can't have too many men who are willing to pay $300 a month to keep their hair from falling out. And she just chuckled. She said, Doctor, you don't know how many vain, insecure men we have in this town. She never did say how many patients she had, but she, she indicated there was a considerable portion of her practice. And so here you can buy things, you can go clothes shopping, new car. Just buy a new car and make you feel better. Show your neighbors that how prosperous you are. Or you can uh, do all you can be in unforgiveness, anger, retaliation, revenge, bitterness. Or you can get right religious. You know, particularly if you've got a false spirit, a Jezebel spirit, which is a spirit of false prophecy. It's a false anointing. And men can have Jezebel spirits just like women. They have a little, they have different names, but Jezebel is the queen. She is in charge. And there's a long list. If you're really interested, get Mitzi Burton's book. She's got a list of them. I've got a list of them. And they all have different manifestations. You need to cast them out. Sometimes somebody will have five or six or seven of these different Jezebel spirits. And then you've got the queen. And she is that uh, bondage spirit. How does it work? I'll explain this in a minute. It works by compulsive thoughts and compulsive actions. First, we must lay some groundwork. Oh, Lord. Mm. We must lay some groundwork. Open your Bible to James chapter 1, verses... Uh, 13 to 15. You have to realize, for you to get into bondage, you have to lose part of your soul. Now, what part of the soul is lost? Generally, your will to resist. Part of your volition. The soul is comprised of your volition, which means your will to do something. You decide you're going to do it. That's a fancy word saying volition. And then your intellect, and you all know what intellect is. That's your smarts and your emotions. Now, those are the three parts of your soul. And your will decides what you're going to do. And if you lose the will to resist, it affects your emotions and it affects your intellect. Now, we know that idolatry will steal part of your soul and cause its learning disabilities. We saw that in Hosea. Do we look at Hosea? I taught on. I taught. I know I talked to the men about it. I don't know if I talked to. If I talked about that, no, I haven't. Okay, let's look at this relationship of loss of the soul. James thirteen one thirteen. Let no one say when he is tempted, "I am tempted by God," for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He Himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Okay? Each one when he is tempted. Now that word tempted means to entice to do wrong by promise of pleasure or gain, or to allure into evil or seduce. And a synonym for it is bait. They bait the hook. What is the hook baited with? Something you want. Satan throws the hook out there. You've been rejected. And Satan will throw that hook out there. Now you've got 
natural senses. You got your eyes, your ears, your nose, your smell, your taste. And that bait goes by and you look at it. And how do you respond to it? You see that new car drive by. And you don't need a new car, no wrong one you got. But that one looks so nice. And you know your neighbors have had their nose up in the air and acted snotty about you. And you're going to show them you just that new car. Hmm? See? Now, I could use lots of other things, but we use a new car today. And so, what does it say? You want that new car. And you are enticed by that new car. The word enticed means to be inflamed. It comes from the French that means to be inflamed. So you see, you sensed it. Intellectually, you think about how much you'd like to have it and how you deserve it. And your emotions get all stirred up and you inflame and you're going to get yourself a new car. And you go down to the dealer to work out the deal. And when desire is conceived, that's when you present it to your mind and you think about it and your will, I mean your emotions are raging and talking to you. And the Holy Spirit which speaks in a soft little voice says, don't do it. But it's drowned it out by the roar of your emotions. You don't go get wise counsel from your wife who say we owe too much now and then the wrong one we got. You know what she's going to say. And so you go and that thing, when desire has conceived, when you decided that you're going to do it, you have it has conceived or been fertilized. And the more you think about it every day, that thing grows in you. And it gives birth to sin. You go down there and you buy it. And now you're in bondage because you got to make payments that you can't make. It's traded in your old cars about paid for and taken on a new bunch of payments. And then you got to face your wife who's unhappy. And when it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, brings death. Now what dies? Do you die? No, you don't die. That part of your soul that would resist that car died. And you go home with all the arguments that you can think of to justify. And you might have to yell a little bit, pout, or whatever you think will satisfy your wife. Or maybe you go buy something you can't afford to placate her. But part of your soul died, and now you're in bondage. Because you're spending. It could have been food. It could have been alcohol. You could have said, I'm not going to smoke cigarettes anymore. And you put that cigarette up there. And that cigarette just seems to do this to you. Now, how does it work? It works through compulsive thoughts and actions. Let's look at uh, let's look at Second uh, Corinthians chapter ten, verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down. Now, the New King James says arguments. The Old King James says vain imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of, thought of God, bringing every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, the word stronghold there is a castle or a redoubt. And that's where the spirit of bondage stays. And you've got these logical arguments, vain imaginations, and high things that exalt itself against the knowledge of God. And then you've got thoughts. Well, where does it say the devil moves through thoughts? 
the devil injects thoughts into your mind. Now, what does it say he can do that? It says in 1 John chapter 13, verse 1, said, The devil having placed in the heart of Judas Iscariot to portray Jesus. The devil put that thought in his mind. Okay? Here we've got... Let's look at 2 Corinthians 2.11. And we'll trace this word thoughts through for a little bit. 2.11. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now that word devices there means thoughts. It's not the same as his wow spoken of in Ephesians, which is methods. This is his thoughts. Well, where else does it... Let's look at... Let's come over to across the page to 4.4. Four. Start with verse 3. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this world has blinded, lest they be, do not believe, lest the gospel of the glory of God should shine on them. Whose the image of God should shine on them. That word mind there, that is the same word as thoughts. Strong's 35.40. Let's come down to 2 Corinthians 10.5. And we've just looked at taking every thought captive. Okay? And let's go to Philippians 4.4. 4, 4. 4 7, I'm sorry. We'll start with verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www. LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Our website is www.LakeHamiltonBibleCamp.com and LHBCOnline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. This is the 2005 Midwinter Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. 4-7, I'm sorry. We'll start with verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ. Use that word guard there means to encompass around with troops or to garrison with troops. Guard your hearts. That word heart and minds. And the word minds is thoughts. Now Satan is thought. Well, you have to decide thoughts have several sources. First, did you decide to think about it? Or did that thought just pop into your mind? Or did you decide that you were going to think about that? Hmm? No, I was farthest thing from my mind. Do you think the Holy Spirit brought that thought up? No, no, the Holy Spirit wouldn't do that. That's not of the Holy Spirit. Well, if it's not of the Holy Spirit, and you didn't decide to bring it up, then there are three sources for it. Sin, dwelling in your flesh. Sin dwells in your flesh. And it says in Romans 6 that you should not let sin reign or rule in your mortal body. Are you all familiar with that scripture? Okay. That's sin. Well, sin can put thoughts in your mind to control you, to reign over you. That's one. Deceitful desires of the flesh in the first person. But again, it's in the first person. It's always, I want, I need, I should, I ought to. Never the second person saying you should. It's always trying to make you think you are thinking it. The soulish desires from your soul. Soulish desires. Well, look at James 3.13. When it says it's selfish or self-centered, this wisdom does not derive from above, but is soul, is earthly, sensual. And that word sensual is sukeish, which means soulish, or demonic. And so the third one is demonic. Got selfish, self-centered thoughts. They're either earthly, 
soulish, or demonic. Demonic. Either a familiar spirit that's projecting that thought into you, or from the bondage spirit within your fleshy body. The last three types of thoughts, those from sin, from your soul, and from the demons, must be rejected and pushed out of your mind. If they're demonic, they must be bound and resisted. And you take the thought captive, and you say, God, I can't do this without you. I need you. I need you, Lord. I need you. For in your flesh dwells no good thing. And you hang on to the cross. When the devil comes in, now when you start this, the devil will come in like a flood. What does the, what does the Bible say? When the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard. Now that's a medieval term. We don't do that. We don't fight wars that way anymore. But in the time of Israel, all the way up to the Middle East, mid, medieval times, you know, they had a shield and they had a sword. And they, it was close combat, you know. And they just, and they had people that sat back and shot arrows at you. But it was close combat. And when an army felt that they were losing, they would look for high ground, and then they would have them, the standard bearer, or the flag bearer, go and hold up the flag, and then they would beat the drum and blow the bugles. And the, everybody would see the standard, and then and the army would make their way and reform around the standard to form a, a defense to keep from being annihilated, to protect their backsides. And so God, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. And that standard is Jesus Christ. He is the cross. Hang on to the cross. You say, Jesus, you died for my sin. You took all of my curses. You took my iniquities and my curses. And Lord, I need you because I can't stand against this without you. And you said you're going to provide for me. If I'm in sin... If I got problems, Lord, I need to straighten out. Show me what they are so I can get rid of them and get close to you. Because I want to turn from my sin. Because God has lifted up the standard. And then it says, Rejoice! And again I say, Rejoice! Be anxious for nothing. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, Rejoice! Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You people know how important thanksgiving is. I can preach for two hours on thanksgiving, but I won't just give you one verse on thanksgiving. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Keep your fingers there in Philippians and come over here to Deuteronomy and look at verse 47, 28, 47. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst and nakedness and need of all things. And He will put a yoke of iron on your neck until He's destroyed you. Thanksgiving. Gladness of heart and joy. Tribulation, what does Philippians say? Be anxious for nothing, but everything. What doesn't everything cover? Everything. The good and the bad. By prayer and, th- and, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your crest be known to God. You know, we had a spirit of supplication poured out this morning in the morning prayer meeting. And I called people there, I said, this is a spirit of supplication, join in. And I said it three times. No one joined in. For God said, I will send on Jerusalem a spirit of supplication and grace. Those who joined in, there were some people who did join in. They got grace. All your gifts are by grace. Nothing comes to you any other way but by grace. So he said, I will pull out the spirit of grace and supplication. People, supplication. 
come before God and supplicate. And let His grace fall upon you. With thanksgiving, thank God for it. Now, what happens then? You've got somebody. These are called subacute autonomic symptoms. Now, you all know that autonomic is something that's not under your control. And when you have chronic anxiety, chronic fear, Merck Manuel said these are the things that happen to you. This is what medicine says happens to you. These are the physical symptoms that you get from fear. And this is what the bondage spirit will do to you to make you obey. You say you're not going to drink anymore. Or you say you're not going to eat. I'm not going to eat sugar anymore. I'm going to go on a 1,600 calorie diet till I get rid of this weight. And then I'm going to stay on a 2,000 calorie diet. I'm not going to gain that weight back. And old bondage just smiles. He said, I've heard that before. And you bent on that diet, and he hits you with confusion. You get a little confused in your head, and you can't concentrate. Decreased attention span. Not as alert. They say, "What's wrong with you?" And you're cloudy, you know, and you got a headache, and your stomach hurts. And you say, "Man," and then he says to you, "You need. I need to eat." No, no, I'm not hungry. I'm not going to eat. And he hits you with this. And then he says, you know, i got low blood. My blood sugar must be low. I'm just not thinking too straight. I need some sugar. I need that donut. And he got them Krispy Kremes in the break room, you know. And he eat three of them. He just consumed 700 calories of pure sugar. Well, maybe he uh, don't want you to use... He says, I need a beer. He said, no, no, I told my wife I wasn't going to drink anymore. At night, I was going to play with the kids. I go drink that beer and go watch television. I'm going to play with the kids. And what does he do? Hands begin to sweat a little bit. Uh, you get a headache, and then you, hand, you get this tingling, dryness around your lips, and tingling there, and your hands begin, your skin begins to itch, and you get a little tremor, you know, get a little nauseating. And you say, man, I need a beer to calm my nerves. Man, I just, I, before I go out there and play with those kids, I need a beer to calm my nerves. That's what that demon says to you. And you say, no, oh, can't do that. And he turns up the heat, makes your ulcer begin to burn, and you get cramps down in your gut, you know, and you suddenly you got to go to the bathroom, and you got to do this, and 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 you just miserable, you got a headache, and you find yourself walking over there, and you pick up that beer and you drink it, and he drives you like that till suddenly, you know, he don't even speak to you anymore. He just hits you, he hits you with those compulsive thoughts. He just, you just walk over there to the refrigerator, open it, and just, or you eating that donut and just picking it up. Stick it in your mouth and don't even realize you got it. You say, what's that doing there? And you all ever had that happen to you? Besides me? That's the spirit of bondage. First it's compulsive thoughts, and then it's compulsive actions. Because the more you yield to it, the stronger it becomes in your life. And what is the trigger? We all have hot buttons. We all have buttons that he hits us with. And over rejection here, you should write offense. What kind of offense bothers you? What do you take offense to? And that's where you need to stick that bondage devil, right there. Because the minute you let that offense come in, maybe your husband didn't speak to you when he came in. Or maybe you came home from work and your wife's had a hard day and she don't greet you. And you look in there and supper's not ready. The same hell have you been doing today? I've been working hard down at the office, and what have you been doing? You've been sitting down doing nothing. See, the answer for that is to get sick and down in your back and let him do the housework for about a week, and he won't ever do say that again. You know, it's like, a, you know, I stayed home and took care of the baby with my wife for two weeks, you know, and had to go back to work, and she said, do you have to go back to work? I said, honey, you don't understand. I get to go back to work. 
<laughs> Your mother's coming tomorrow, and I get to go back to work. Oh, Lord, praise God. But that is, and it will drive you either in fear or pride, and that thing goes round and round and round. So what do you do with it? Realize that you can't stand against it in your own will. And if it's been there a long time, you didn't get in that position overnight, and you won't get out overnight. And no 15-minute prayer is going to get rid of all of that. It will start you, and it will open you so that you can begin your walk to freedom. But it's a walk, and it requires discipline, and it's a walk the rest of your life. It requires self-discipline and obedience. Obedience to the Word of God. And so what do you do? The first thing, the main essentials of walking in freedom are daily prayer, a regular schedule of Bible reading, a routine of fasting. Just as food and water and rest are essential for physical health, they're spiritual essentials of life, freedom, and wholeness. Walking is a lifestyle of forgiveness and love, which remain essential to be free. For every offense that you encounter, you must respond in love. It's not natural for you to respond in love when someone hurts you, but you must lean on God and cry out for grace and mercy. And God's love flows out of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness and love are the aspects of the living water that nourishes our soul, the souls that we forgive. And so what do you do? You said, I don't have time to read the Bible and pray. I'm going to tell you, if you want to walk in freedom, you don't have time not to. You can't afford not to. I tell people to unplug the television set and turn it around and face the wall. Unplug that monster, that idol that rules your household, that sits in the center of the living room and all the chairs arranged around it. I don't own one. I have not owned one for 25 years. I didn't look at one except sometimes I'd go down to the doctor's lounge when I was waiting on a baby to be born and try to find a John Wayne movie. If not, I watched the History Channel or the Learning Channel. I could tell some stories about some of the things I've seen on the Learning Channel. Huh. But uh, give up watching television read the Bible for an hour. Give up your favorite TV program. And nothing but a bunch of filth and trash comes over it anyway. And read the Bible for an hour. Join a Bible study club. Study the Bible. Most Bible commentators say read three and a half chapters a day and you'll read through the Bible in a year's time. You should read through the Bible every year. Some people read more than that. You read out loud so you can hear it. Because faith comes by hearing, by hearing the Word of God. Now, I don't say go get the Bible on tape and play let somebody else read it while you listen because your mind will wander. Read it. The Oriental method is to read aloud so you can hear it. And the Bible is an Oriental book. It's not a Western European book. It's an Oriental book. And it has Oriental philosophy. It is written from Oriental understanding. And I guess that's a better word than saying philosophy. It's written from Oriental understanding. And the Orient, read it aloud so you can hear it. Set up a routine of fasting to deny you. Now, how you fast is between you and God. You can fast by fasting one meal a day, two meals a day. You can fast by Eating just vegetables, you can fast in a number of different ways. Ask God, how should you fast? I recommend that you give up all sweets. I say if it tastes sweet, spit it out. You give up refined sugar, and you will be a lot healthier, and you will be less likely to get diabetes. And I'm going to tell you something. Type 2, type two diabetes is a, is a bad disease. It is a bad disease. We're seeing it now in in 16, 17-year-old kids. We used to not see it till somebody was 40 and grossly overweight. It's because of the increased amount of sugar that's been seen. Pray. Get up in the morning and pray. Husband and wife, pray. I tell you, the husband and wife will come together in the Spirit and pray. It is the most powerful cell. The enemy will do anything to stop that. He will attack you. But I'll tell you, you will put him to flight. 
And you can claim your children and your grandchildren. You can claim the people that He gives you and He lays on your heart. He can protect your house and your children and your family. You can drive sickness far from you. It is said that 70% of the people who come into doctor's offices come in because of their nerves, all their, for those subacute autonomic symptoms I was talking about. I think that 99% of all disease is demonic, one way or another. God said that you should walk in health. It says in Deuteronomy, and it says in Exodus, that you should walk in health, and that His Word is medicine to all your flesh. People, but you know, people will spend hours sitting in doctor's office and spend, and spend half their fortune there, and won't spend an hour a day reading the Word of God, which is the best medicine in the world. And so, today we're going to break the spirit of bondage. We're going to break His power. We're going to start attacking her. We're going to break the, the curses, and we're going to bind her, and we're going to command her to come out. We'll break her tentacles loose, and ask God to restore a portion of your brain, a portion of your soul that's been stolen. And you have to decide what you're in bondage to, and that's the thing you're going to have to bind. You have to decide what you want to get rid of. What is plaguing you? What's driving you? And repent of the rebellion and the bitterness the anger and the fear that has driven you. And decide that you're going to love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you and spitefully use you. Look at First Peter. It's James, Hebrews, James, First Peter. First Peter chapter 4, verse 8. But the end of verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love one for another, for love will cover a multitude of sin. That word sin can be translated offenses. Love the people who offend you. Pray for them. Matthew 5, 44, 45 says, pray for your enemies. Pray for those who spitefully use you and abuse you, that you may be a child of your Father who is in heaven. Luke 6 is the same thing. When you start praying for your enemies, seriously laboring in prayer for them, and speak blessings upon them, it will set you free. Touch your enemy too, but it will set you free to worship God. And so think about that thing that upsets you, that thing that drives you, and ask God to set you free. And then we're going to come against the spirit of bondage. We'll all stand up now. It's said that the brain can only absorb what the panic can endure. All your blood settle down in your feet, your legs, your back. You need to get it circulating up to your brain again. Praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's jump around and praise God a little bit, folks. Praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord. Oh, God, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God, pour out your spirit, Lord God. Pour out your spirit. Praise you and bless you and glorify you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, God, thank you, Lord. Say, dear Lord, I believe. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He died on the cross for my sin, was raised for the dead for my justification, ascended into heaven, sits on the right hand of God the Father, ever to make intercession for me. God is my Father. Jesus is my big brother. I am a child of the living God. I thank you, Lord, that you didn't give me a spirit of fear, of power and of love and a sound mind. You set me free from the spirit of bondage to fear in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. I bind the spirit of bondage in Jesus' name. I confess the sins of my fathers, all the sins of idol worship, of whoredom, Idolatry, alcoholism, 
In the name of Jesus, I break the power of the occult over my family line. I break all these curses for all sexual sin, incest, illegitimacy, and whoredom. In the name of Jesus, I break the curse of the vagabond and all other curses. In the name of Jesus, I break the curse of the liar and the thief. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. For your word says, Jesus was made a curse for me that I might be delivered from the curse of the law. Now, Lord, you know the thing that binds me, that torments me, that holds me in bondage, that decreases the effectiveness of my witness for you. Lord, I want to witness for you. I want to be for your glory. I want to bear fruit for you, Lord. Set me free from this, Lord. Lord, set me free from the Spirit. Now here I want each one of you to name very quietly the spirits that have bound you, that hold you in bondage, in compulsive actions, compulsive thoughts, tormenting thoughts, driving thoughts. It's very quietly now. Just name them. Don't look around. Just quietly to yourself. God, I confess these to you. I break the curse of them. With your strength, Lord, and your power, I will turn from them and not repeat them. I place them under the blood of Jesus. Your word says, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord Jesus, break the curses on my life of being rebellious and stubborn against my parents and the elders that you placed over me. Forgive me, Lord. Break the curse over me, Lord. And my children, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I turn away, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Now, you spirit of bondage, I bind you in Jesus' name. I isolate you from all other spirits. You can draw no power, authority from any other spirit. You can communicate with no other spirit. I bind you and I cast you out. For it is written in Joel 2.32, Anyone calls on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Leave me now in Jesus' name. Everybody sit down now. I want you to keep both feet on the floor, your hands in your lap. Don't cross your fingers, don't cross your hands, don't cross your feet. Cross your legs. Remember when you were a little kid, you said, uh, I don't have to do it because I have my fingers crossed? Hmm? The devil sees you got your feet crossed, so well, he don't mean that. I don't have to do that. That's not a lawful command because they don't mean it. Devil is an absolute legalist. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Now you foul devils, you foul serpentine devils, I just bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. I come against the spirit of Jezebel now. The Jezebel mind control in the name of Jesus. It came in from rejection, came in from rebellion, stubbornness, from pride and fear. In the name of Jesus, I speak to you, you spirit of rebellion. I bind you and I break your power. You speak to you, you spirit of stubbornness. I bind you and I break your power. In the name of Jesus. Turn on loose now. Come on out, rejection. Come on out. Out, out, rejection. Come on out. All right. Out, out. Fear, fear. Come on out now. All you fear spirits. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Fear. Come on out, fear. Bondage to fear. Come out. Come on out there in the name of Jesus. All fear, all anxiety, all heaviness, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out all heaviness, all terror, come out in the name of Jesus. All despondency, I bind you and I break your power. All depression and heaviness, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come on out. Out, 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 out in the name of Jesus. Don't you stay there. You come out in the name of Jesus. I lose the hornets to drive you out in Jesus' name. 
God said he would send his angel before him, and he would send the hornets to drive you out in Jesus' name. Come out, you Hittites. I come against all the Hittite spirits, the spirits of terror and fear in the name of Jesus, and I break your power, and I command you to go. Come on out. Come on out. All spirits of love, of denial of love, fear of rejection, fear of rejection, come out. Fear of rejection, come out. Come out. Fantasy, fantasy spirits, fantasy and idolatry, I bind you and I break your power. Come on out in the name of Jesus Christ. All love of the world, the love of the world, the lust of the eye. Come out, lust of the eye in the name of Jesus Christ. All lust of the eye. I bind you and I break your power. All you spirits are going to the beauty parlor. High maintenance spirits in the name of Jesus. Come out. Come out. All you spirits. Come out in the name of Jesus. Got to buy clothes. Come out in the name of Jesus. Come out. Out. Got to buy things. Come out to make yourself feel better. I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. Come out. 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 All you seductive spirits. Come out. Come on out. All spirits of seduction, come out in the name of Jesus. Seducing spirits, come out. Out. Out in the name of Jesus. All you seducing spirits, come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power. Fem, fem fatal spirits, come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. Out. Out. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, come out. Lust of the flesh, come out. Come out. Come out. Come out. All anorexia spirits, all bulimia spirits, come out. All gluttony spirits, spirit of gluttony, bondage to gluttony, come out. Bondage to gluttony, bondage to bulimia, bondage to, come out. Bondage to anorexia, anorexia, an anorexia, I bind you. I break your power and I command you to go. Come out, anorexia, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, gluttony, gluttony spirits, come out in the name of Jesus. I bind you and I break your power. Alcohol, alcohol, drug spirits, drug spirits, intoxication spirits, come out, 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 whoredom spirits, come out, whoredom, whoredom spirits, I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name, come out of there, you let people go, you let God's people go, come out of there, in the name of Jesus, I break your power in Jesus' name, I command you to go, bondage, bondage the whoredom, come out, bondage, come out, out. Out, bondage, I break your power in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave God's people. Go, go in Jesus' name. Go, go, go. Witchcraft, witchcraft, narcissism, narcissism, spirits of narcissism, self-centered, self-worship. Come out, come out. Spirit of Narcissus, come out. Narcissus, bipolar spirits, I bind bipolar, come out. Manic depressive, bipolar, passive aggressive, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Go. Go in Jesus' name. Spirits of heaviness, come out. Depression, heaviness, bipolar spirits, come out. Bipolar 1, bipolar 2, bipolar 3, I bind all of you. And I break your power in Jesus' name. I command you to leave God's people. Come out, all you bondage devils. I bind you and I break your power. You can't torment God's people anymore. Turn it loose in the name of Jesus. Turn it loose in the name of Jesus. Go. Go in Jesus' name. All of you, come out. In Jesus' name, I bind you and I break your power. Come out, all spirits of greed now. Witchcraft control. Witchcraft control. Control through money. Control through social position. Control of the children through manipulation. Come out. Come out. Come out. Manipulating your wife. Manipulating your husband. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you and I break your power. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Come out, bondage. Bondage, I bind you and I break your power. I command you to leave now, bondage. Bondage, I bind you. Come out, bondage. I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. You turn God's people loose. Don't you tear them. You come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. All of you bondage spirits. I speak bondage now. Bondage to rebellion. Come out, bondage to rebellion. Come out, bondage to rebellion, bondage to witchcraft. I'm going to make them do what I want them to do. They don't listen to me. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, they're not going to ignore me. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you and I break your power. Come out of there, bondage in the name of Jesus. Come out, bondage, bondage. Come out, you pecking spirits, pecking spirits. I bind you, you pecking devils. Come out. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, all the spirits of bondage, of stubbornness, and bondage, and idolatry, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I break your power, all divination spirits. Now I come against divination spirits, and I break their power. Jezebel, I'm speaking to you. Come out, Jezebel, in the name of Jesus Christ. I come against Tinka, Tinka, come out, Tinka, in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind Tinka, I bind the spirit of abortion, I bind the spirit of hatred of children, in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of hatred of men. Come out! All lesbian spirits, all homosexual spirits, come out! Fear of men, fear of women, come out! Fear of embassy, come out! In the name of Jesus Christ, I bind you and I break your power. Come out! Come out! Sexual fragility, in the name of Jesus, I bind you and I break your power in Jesus' name. Come out! Moloch! Shamush! In the name of Jesus, I bind you! Tinka! Iris, in the name of Jesus, I break the power of Iris and Avis. Avis, I bind you. Baal, come out, Baal, in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, come out, come out. Bind you and I break your power in the name of Jesus. I speak healing and restitution. Healing and restitution. I command you to go now. Leave God's people in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on out. Come out. All you spirits of idolatry and whoredom, come out now. All you spirits of idolatry and whoredom, I bind the spirits of idolatry and whoredom that have stolen people's soul in the name of Jesus Christ. I break the power of dyslexia in the name of Jesus, of learning disabilities, of memory loss in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind memory loss, can't learn, can't remember. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I Bind you and I break your power and I speak restoration of the soul. In the name of Jesus, I break the covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ has annulled your covenant. The blood covenant that was made, the blood of Jesus has annulled that covenant. In the name of Jesus, this is a bride of Christ. She's under a new covenant. You are not married to her. I bind you and I break your power and command you to go. Come out that spirit that won't let them learn. Come out, you learning disability. Come out, you reading disability. Come out, you hearing disability. Come out. Come out, you deaf and dumb demon. I bind you and I break your power, you deaf and dumb demon. I break your power and I command you to go. Let's speak healing now. Healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, you spirit of epilepsy. Come out. You spirit of tearing. Come out. Now come against all the serpentine devils. All the serpentine devils of pain. All you serpentine devils that cause muscle cramps. Come out. All you serpentine devils, I bind you, cause pain and muscle cramps. Come out now. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. I pull you out. I command you to uncoil now and land up in, in rank and fire. And come out. You can't stay there. I bind you. You can't hold on to one another. I send the spirit of fire and destruction to burn your roots out. I burn you. I burn you in the name of Jesus. I send the Holy Ghost with the hooks to hook your nose and to pull you out. I break the power of pride of Leviathan. Lord, you said you would break his power. Break his back, Lord, in the name of Jesus Break the power of pride now, Lord. Break his back, Lord. You said you would send it, Lord. You would break his back. Break his back now, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Break his back. Put your foot on his neck, Lord, and put him out in the name of Jesus Christ. I bind you and I break your power, you foul devil. And I pull out those snake spirits in the name of Jesus. And I command you to go. Go in Jesus' name. Come out. Come out. Uncoil off of their minds now. Uncoil off their minds in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord. Touch them now, Lord God. I speak restoration to them in the name of Jesus, Lord. I speak restoration. I come against headaches now. I come against migraine headaches. Migraine headaches, I bind you and I command you to go. All headaches, go. All witchcraft headaches, go. All dyslexia, go. All encephalitis, go. All brain tumors, go. Go, all cancer, go. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I bind the deaf and dumb spirits. I bind the spirit of deafness in the name of Jesus, of vertigo, of dizziness. I say, come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. I break your power in Jesus' name. 
I come against dry mouth in the name of Jesus. Sore tongue, dry mouth in the name of Jesus. Congestion in the sinuses, congestion in the nose, congestion in the nasal passages, congestion in the sinus. I bind you all. I command you to leave. Go. You're not wanted here. We bind all allergies. We break their power in the name of Jesus. Speak to the immune system. You line up with the Word of God. Line up with the Word of God. I break. I pull out the root of bitterness. I pull out the root of bitterness in the name of Jesus. I pull out the, the knife of betrayal. All the, all the wounding arrows in the name of Jesus. I speak healing in Jesus' name. Touch them now, Lord God. Touch their hearts. Touch their hearts, Lord. I bind high blood pressure. Touch their hearts, Lord. Touch their lungs. I bind asthma. I bring heart failure. I bind congestion, pneumonia in the name of Jesus. All stomach ulcers, all gastroesophageal reflux, all diarrhea, all colitis, Crohn's disease. In the name of Jesus, I bind you all ulcerative colitis, all vaginitis, cystitis. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Come out, pancreatitis. Come out, diabetes, arthritis, fibromyalgia. I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. All arthritis. I bind arthritis. I pull out the root of bitterness. And I bind the spirit of arthritis. Try joints, I say, be moist. Cartilage, I say, grow back. In the name of Jesus Christ. Cartilage, grow back. Strokes, I bind you. I bind the spirit of stroke. I say, withered limbs be restored in the name of Jesus. I say, eyes, blind eyes be opened. Deaf ears hear. Blind eyes see in the name of Jesus. Lord, pour out your spirit. I bind cataracts, Lord. I bind nearsighted, farsighted, astigmatism. I speak healing to God's people. Oh, God, pour out your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Pour your spirit out. Drive out anything that offends you, Lord. For there is deliverance in Mount Zion. There is healing in Mount Zion. Just touch your people. Touch your people, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Everybody stand up and praise God. Praise you, Lord God. Praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, God, fill your people now. Send your war angels out, Lord, to gather up all the souls that's been stolen. Restore them, Lord. You said you'd lead us beside green pastures and still waters, and you would restore our souls. Restore their soul. The lion has rendered their soul, Lord. Restore what the caterpillar, the canker worm, and the palmer worm have stolen. I speak restoration now. And I thank you for it, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless the food. Bless those that cooked it and those that are going to eat it, Lord. Just bless it now in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.